there. MS Paint. That's yeah, Paint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sick. Let's uh let's jump in. Sweet. Baxter Mayworld, welcome back to the podcast for whatever number it is. I think you said Number's six. Seven. I'm gonna see on a run with six. We'll yeah. just go with six. That depends if you um count all the ones I do with dry or not. True. Yeah, then well, I think we've done we've done four just with Jai probably. Mm. I would love to do another one with Jai, but it's like hurting a cat. That, that guy's too flaky. <laughs> he says it's busy, but I don't think he's he always tell, he's always telling me I'm the one that's flaky, but I don't know, I reckon it's probably him. Well you're here <laughs> and he's not, so I also have a broken wrist and not much <laughs> yeah. going on. But yeah, no, nah, to be to be fair, the last few times that we've supposed we're like meant to do one with Jai and it hasn't happened has been my fault. So it has. But we're all busy people. It's hard. We're here now. Um, what's been happening? I've seen you've been over in New Zealand for a while. Yeah, what hasn't been happening? Um I when was the last time we did one? That's probably a good good spot to start. Last time I spoke to you was probably like a quick catch up in Medina. That well, I had a Juro jam, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Holy shit, fair bits happened since then. And it would have been um, before that. So probably better. Yeah. Year. Okay. Well, we don't really need to cover any of the bus situation. I feel I feel like that's been pretty covered. <laughs> you um, had a bus? What bus? Touchy subject. Um, if you don't know about the bus, go listen to the one I did with you and the one that I did with Dean. What about yeah. oh, the one you did with um, old the mate? Is, uh, the, one, the main one that talks about the bus is the one I did with Dean, though. Yeah. But that gives the full backstory for like, it feels like three hours, but it's only like half an hour. But anyway, moving on from that. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, since we spoke last in Medina, um, I think the week after that, I booked flights in New Zealand. You had f- flights booked and you were like leaving the week, I'm pretty sure. Okay, well, like, sweet. Like the 1st of January yeah. you bailed, right? Yeah, during that trip to Medina, I think I, I was I was like kind of keen to go. I tried to go twice, but COVID had shut me down. Um, and it was sort of at that point where like, you know, you tell people you're going to do something and I do this heaps. I'll like happily admit to that. I tell people I'm going to do stuff and then it just, for whatever reason, it just never happens. Um, going to New Zealand was starting to become one of those things where I was like, yeah, yeah I'm going to come over this summer. I'm going to come over this summer. Like telling Jai, telling like Remy and everyone that's over there. I was like, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming. And I'll just never come. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I tried to go twice during COVID. Um and like a week or whatever before like my flights got cancelled then i tried to go for crankworks rotorua um i had had like the miq whatever it was called like the accommodation sorted like i was going to get that paid for had my flights booked had everything booked to like go as a professional athlete that had you know special Mm. things to be able to go yeah privileges um and then literally like two days before I was supposed to fly, my flights got cancelled and I I couldn't even book another flight if I wanted to. There were just no more flights. So, um, yeah, tried and tried and tried and then had obviously sold the bus, had some cash. I was in Medina and pretty sure it was raining one day and we were just having a coffee at the cafe and I was like, fuck this. <laughs> 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 Um, and just right then and there just booked like the first flight that I could afford, which happened to be on January 1st. So <laughs> new year, new me. <laughs> um, and yeah, that was pretty much that. It was like, I know that it caused a few of my sponsors some drama. Sorry, Johnny. Um, the fact that like I'd just signed with Lusty and we we're kind of still working through like, you know, small things like what what groups I wanted to run or like what bar bend I liked best or whatever. And then I just pissed off to New Zealand without like really any warning. 
So they all came back from like Christmas break and I was like, yo, I'm in Queenstown. <laughs> and I'm just like, we can't really do much for you. Um, we, luckily, we got it all worked out. But um, yeah, January 1st, flew to Queenstown, started a new life, one-way flight. The one-way flight thing doesn't surprise me at all. But uh... I only got enough money to book one flight at a time. Yeah, I rate it. <laughs> Book flights, worry about everything else later. It's the best. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so is it because like last year and stuff just couldn't send you product? Or is it like a conflict with the distributor in New Zealand? And no, that? no. It, it was just like it was a bit of a mix of things. It's like um, obviously international postage of like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, if you send like a small item, it's sort of not really worth like what's the point. Mm. Um, but then if you send like a big box, it's like, well, that's going to cost you shitloads. And then also the main the main issue wasn't necessarily like, yeah, it costs a fair bit, which is a pain in the ass, um, but it's just slow. They mm. just take forever. So they were just like, yeah, sweet, we could send you something, but like, we don't know when it's going to get there. Like once it leaves the warehouse, it's kind of like out of our control. Mm. Um, and then with it being like brand new stuff, like you kind of got to, it's a bit dodgy to like not pay like ta- like import mm-hmm. taxes. And I don't know, I don't actually even know what the, like I'm, I don't have enough information on like what the import taxes and stuff involved coming from Australia to New Zealand. But I'm sure if you were just like, constantly posting brand new boxes of stuff from like a distributor to a person. Like at some yeah. point they're going to be like, hang on a minute. Um, so yeah. Sorry, Johnny, for all the headache, but um, yeah, they, they helped me out pretty good still. Um, yeah. And we, yeah, we kind of got it all sorted, but yeah. Would recommend booking a one-way flight to New Zealand. And um, I probably have to thank Jai just right off the bat. I don't think Jai heaps for <laughs> sorting my life out when I got there. Is that like a low point when Jai mother is sorting out your life? <laughs> no, nah, he's pretty. He's got his shit pretty. Ah, uh, he had his shit pretty together when I got there. Yeah, I love that guy, but fuck, he's loose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Jai and Annie and Booker. Um, yeah, would have had a pretty different experience if those those three weren't over there. So thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't have accommodation or anywhere to stay or anything booked, or just just the flight. I had the flight booked, and um, Annie was going to pick me up from the airport, but then she didn't realise that I was flying on January first. So like mm. New Year's, New Year's Eve, Annie being Annie being, uh, you know, just going with whatever's happening at that exact moment um on new year's eve she was like oh i'm actually going away like to the coast i'm not sure if i'll be back um i'll let you know and i was like <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so then i called Jai and i was like yo you reckon you picked me up from the airport and um do you reckon i could stay on your couch for a couple of nights and he was like yeah sweet no worries um and then yeah annie did get back from the coast for like another three days or something <laughs> And then I end up staying on Jai's couch for, I don't know, like a week. And then, <laughs> and then Le- young Leroy came over as well, which I was supposed to have had something else sorted by the time Leroy arrived because I was like, yeah. oh, we kind of can't have that many people in the house. But luckily sort of made friends with everyone else in the house pretty quick. And they were like, oh, yeah, sweet, like whatever. If you, wanna, if you need to stay for a bit longer, that's fine. So then I end up sleeping on the mattress on the floor in the lounge room behind the couch while Leroy stayed on the couch. <laughs> um, and then I ended up starting to pay like a little bit of rent to stay in the living room. And then I was like, well, if I'm paying rent, like then I cleaned out the like storage space underneath the stairs in the basement, like where the laundry was. <laughs> and I was like, I may as well like make myself a room. So everyone in the house was cool with me doing that. Um, 
Well, at least they said they were. <laughs> um, and, yeah, so I moved in under the stairs for, like, a month, I think it was. Just full yeah. Harry Potter spec. Just full Harry Potter. Yeah. Except Harry Potter had a luxury. He had, like, a light in his room and a door. <laughs> How'd you get in there? Is it, like, just open space? It's just, like, open space. Just, like, the stairs were, like, just went up. And the, there wasn't, like, there wasn't, like, a storage cupboard. It was literally just, like, a void under the stairs. It works. So I can put my bed there and, yeah, good to go. Went and bought a little, like, one of those, like, square cube, like, shelving units from Kmart. Yeah. You know the ones. And, um, yeah, that was, like, my, yeah, that was my bedroom. So I stayed there for a bit. And then. Um, and Leroy was still on the couch? No, nah, Leroy only stayed for, like, a week. And then he okay. moved in with um, someone else, went to Billy's house or something. Um, but it's a few other people came and went from the couch. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then when Booker went back to Tassie, which it, this bit of the trip worked out like so perfectly, um, Booker went back to Tassie and he left me with his van, which is like mm-hmm. kitted out with a bed and stuff. And I, I was like starting to get kind of sick from like being under the stairs just because like such a stuffy, like I cleaned it as best I could, but it's still just like, a musty kind of zone. Um, so then I ended up moving into Booker's van and just sleeping in the driveway, which was like pretty dialed. Um, and then <clears throat> that only lasted for like a few nights. And then because Booker had left and they were trying to get somebody to move into Dan's old room, which was at Annie's house, then mm. I ended up moving in to Dan's old room. So Dan was like the savior. It was like perfect timing. Like he left. I got his van. And I was like, cool. This is me for a bit. And I was like, hang on a minute. Double upgrade. I'm moving into a fucking house with a bedroom. <laughs> um, so yeah, shout out dad for helping me um, cover rent for a month. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah, going to say, like, how did you, were you working? Yeah. Or like doing anything over there? Or I was just living, I was just living off the money from the bus. Okay. Yeah, um, and then I got it. I ended up getting a job at uh, Drop Cafe. Shout out to Bushy for bringing me on as the barista with zero experience whatsoever. Um, I was like going to Drop to get coffee because like I knew the owner and it, like my friends worked there, and it was like quite a nice little zone just to hang out. I just kind of ended up spending so much time in there that I was like. You want to pay me to be here? <laughs> um, because, uh, yeah, got a job there a couple of days a week, which like pretty much that covered like a bit of my rent and some food. And then, yeah, dad like loaned me some money to cover the rest of my rent, which meant that I could stay in New Zealand with like the intention of like progressing as a writer. Mm. Which was my that was my goal from the start. Um to go there and not have to really work and be able to just like go to the gym two or three days a week, do my intervals, ride my bike heaps, shoot whatever content I wanted to shoot, go to whatever event I need to go to and not have to worry about working. And now I'm dead broke. So you were full pro pro life over there, right? I was a yeah, I was a pro without the paycheck Sick. <laughs> so <Yeah>. dirt back <laughs> sure yeah yeah kind of kind of like it it definitely worked um i think my riding in the last like especially after crankworks rotorua when i had just a month of like i can just go hard as fuck because i don't really have much um coming up that i need to you know i can't get injured for or whatever or i could get mm. I could like have a small injury and I had time to recover before cans or whatever. <laughs> so as soon as I got back from um, Crankworks or Rotorua, I was just like, sweet, now's my time to like just go ham on like learning new shit. Like that was when I flipped dream. That was when I started learning like no foot cans. That was when mm. like in my opinion, I was like riding my downhill bike the best. Like 
but that last week, like everything kind of fell into place and or not last week, last like three weeks, everything kind of fell into place and it all clicked. And I was like, holy fuck, like this is like, this is actually paid off. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's definitely like from my perspective, being there helped me, um, helped me like progress in the ways I wanted to. And on the other side of the coin from like an outside perspective, at least from my, like from what I've interacted with people anyway, it like, it seems like now I'm a professional athlete and I'm getting paid, (laughs) which is sweet, but I'm not. (laughs) Make it till you make it. (laughs) Yeah. Make it till you make it. I mean, yeah. Like last year helped me out a little bit and Canyon helped me out a little bit, but it's like, not a it's not like a sustainable income put it that way how would one thing i just wanted to touch on before we move on too far but did mm. your results from crankworks roto give you a bit of kick in the ass as well because you're like qualified 10th in the downhill and did a bunch of pretty good results right yeah i'm glad they look good on paper <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i from from like the Crankworks summer series, I learned heaps. Um, like I rocked up to slalom for the summer series and was like, oh, well, my bike is not set up for slalom, even though I thought it was. <laughs> um, and like <clears throat> I qualified for the downhill for the summer series. I was I qualified third, like a second behind Loris Verge or whatever. And I was like, holy fuck, like I am riding pretty good at the moment, turns out. <laughs> <laughs> um and then, yeah, that kind of was like a good little learning experience. Um, and then I got to Rotorua like relatively confident, I suppose. Um, and yeah, qualified good in the downhill. Then my race run was just put that in the bin. Like it, nothing really went to plan. Like my my goggles never fog up ever, but <laughs> they it fogged up. Like, whilst I was in the gate and I was like in hindsight I should have just taken them off like I had a mud guard on like I should have just ripped them off and would have probably done better for me but um and then I just overrode the top bit of the track even though like I was going way too fucking fast off the camera like all the bits (laughs) of the track you couldn't see obviously on on camera I was just cruising but nah um (laughs) the whole whole top bit of the track until I crashed um I was realistically going way too fucking fast and pushing way too hard for like how little I could see. <laughs> <laughs> um and then I kind of then I crashed just there's like a shoot right before you like cross the road where the big jumps are. Like mm-hmm. basically right before the actual camera like the live stream starts. <laughs> um and then from there I was like cool right, just don't be a dickhead and make it to the bottom without crack like I would hate to crash twice. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was like just real random. I think I, I kind of figured out roughly like why. I think it was because I'd like tightened my goggle straps up so that my goggles wouldn't move at all on my face, which meant there was like no air circulation. And then on top of that, our race run was like later in the day than we'd ever ridden for practice. I was dropping in at like five o'clock. So mm. I guess just like the humidity or the condensation or whatever was just like higher. And then because I'd done a proper warm up, I was warm when I put my goggles on versus being cold. Like it, like there's a whole bunch of different factors I think that led to my goggles fogging. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of annoying. Put that in the bin. But yeah, my qualifying result from that event was like pretty good. I think I was like. Point two behind Ollie's wall. Mm. Um, and yeah, like right up there in the mix, which was a good bit of confidence for the rest of the week. And then surprised myself in speed and style, put the pump track in the bin. Um, and slalom, I was going all right until I went against Jackson. And then I just put, I just crashed all week, it felt like. <laughs> but in between, in between crashing, I had like some moments of bike riding where I was like, which were like really confidence inspiring. Mm. 
So, I don't know. I forget what the initial question was. Sorry. I was just talking about talking about Roto. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Like, all in all, I felt like I rode really good when I was not on the ground that week, pretty much. But I just <laughs> felt like I spent a lot of time crashing, which feels like up until now, I've broken my wrist. It kind of feels like that's what. <laughs> that's what my years consisted of like <laughs> I just feel like I've crashed all year which I guess is how I know that I'm like at, like I'm on that tipping point of like mm. finding where my limit is and kind of like unlocking another another gear or whatever another level whatever you want to like call it but because until like I haven't crashed in ages really mm. like I, don't, I don't often crash um, which is probably good but it's probably also a reflection of exactly how I felt, which is like I'm just always pretty comfortable with what I'm mm. doing. Whereas this year I've spent a lot of time being like uncomfortable and pushing my limits. And as a result of that, I spent a lot of time on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> well like after Roto you came back right for Rebo and then you had that. Um well after was it after months. or was it before? I think it was before. The thread burn ups is in March. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty or sure. Did you go back? I so, I went, yeah. So, we had the summer series. Mm. And then I flew back for, yeah, I, I was just. That's right. Because you missed like two days out. of practice or something because you flew for, for thread burn. No, no, no. I had, I got the whole event. Okay. Yeah, for the whole thing. Um, I got in like the day before practice started. Yeah, the official got, practice. Yeah. Yeah, I I was only there for the official practice. I wasn't there the week early like everyone else. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> what do you say? So, yeah, I, I had some had the summer series, and then, uh, yeah, for Cannonball or National Champs, I'm just going to call it Cannonball. Um, Cannon Nats. Cannonball. <laughs> <laughs> For Cannonball, uh, yeah, just did a bit of FIFA work, just fly in, fly out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah, thanks. That was pretty sick. Thanks to Lusty for cooking me up that week. I, like, I pretty much paid for my flights, and then they picked me up from the airport, put me in an accommodation, bought me dinner most nights, and sick. took me back to the airport, and off I went. Like, it was pretty sick. Um, so yeah, flew in for that. I had been after, um, the summer series, I got really sick. Yeah. So I just spent like literally a week or so. That was also the tipping point where I was like, fuck, I need to sort out somewhere else to stay because a combination of like overworking myself and being in like a, not the best sleeping quarters. I just got like so mm. fucking sick. Um, just like really run down, like fatigued and like couldn't do, like if I tried to like walk to the other end of the house, I'd like have like head spins and shit. I was like, whoa. Um, so I pretty, I just got over that before, um, before flying to Cannibal. And even then I was still like, you know, when you're just managing, yeah, you're like, if I push a little bit, I'm going to get sick. But right now, like at this level, I'm okay. I'm just like, just managing my health. Um, yeah. So I got to Cannibal and I like hadn't ridden for a week. I was like feeling pretty weak, not feeling amazing. And then I, I got out on track and like, obviously that track, you have to be like mentally mm-hmm. on your A game, physically on your A game. And it will just like, chew you up and spit you out if you're not. <laughs> yep. Um, so I was like, knew that I wasn't, yeah, feeling that good. Um, did a few practice runs and confirmed to myself that I wasn't feeling that good. <laughs> um, so right off the bat, I was like not very confident on track and then got to qualifying and I just like overrode everything. It was just like going too hard obviously, mm-hmm. and then just had that huge fucking crash, which <laughs> I've watched that back and dad's watched that back 
and we have just like I just watch it and I was like, oh, what the fuck are you doing? Like <laughs> you can see exactly why I crashed and you can see exactly how I could have probably saved it. Like I just rode into the chute, not too fast. Like other people were going in just as fast. Mm. Um, and the line that I had was not the best line, not the worst line. It was, you know, mm. other people riding the same line. Um, and I, I <clears throat> think I just like started looking at my front wheel and then I got like a bit squirrely and just grabbed a handful of brake. And obviously like you grabbed a handful of brake, you can't turn, like can't your, suspension, your suspension is not working very well. And then like, I just tensed up and just should have just let go of my brake and just looked at where I wanted to go. But instead I just like grabbed a handful of brake, tensed up and looked at the fucking bunting. <laughs> Look straight at Matt's, <laughs> Matt Staggs or Captain Ray, yeah. whoever was inside. Yeah. And I was just like, I remember like, I, I, like thinking back to it, I remember like as soon as I started getting sketchy, I was like, I just want to stop. I just want to fucking stop. <laughs> That's my plan. And I'll just keep going. But obviously, yeah, it was – like watching it back, I'm just like, that's such, a, it's kind of like a pretty embarrassing crash because it, like it looks like a full rookie mistake kind of thing, but it's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a wild spot to crash as well. It's like the worst. <laughs> yeah. At least I made it far enough down that like I landed in the bushes. Mm. If you had a crash at the top, you'd be, you'd be heaps worse off. But also I had that, um, I got like a new, Mm. Was it the rock fight like TLD, like chest protector? Mm-hmm. So I was wearing that, had a fresh helmet on, had like fresh knee pads on, which unfortunately I ripped. Um, but yeah, like I had that cut, like a cut from the bushes and rocks and shit, like where the chest protector finished. Yeah. Okay. So like I'm pretty thankful I was wearing that because I feel like without having that on, like, I don't know. I just felt like straight on my chest and my back and shit. So it probably would have been not saying it would have been catastrophic, but I would have felt yeah. a lot more sorry for myself. Yeah. Well, you saw like Blake from Revo's crash last year where he just ragged old from the top and both fleet feet blew out. And yeah, that was wild. I don't know if I did see that. Oh, I'll, that send it to, I'll send it to you later. Yeah. He full bounced yeah. off the rock and yeah, it was sick. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I crashed and then pretty much my weekend went up from there. I started having heaps more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Did you race? I can't remember if you raced. No, I didn't race. Um, so I crashed. I know, like, I was disappointed in myself. Like, it was pretty, like, heavy vibes back at the house that night because <laughs> that – Obviously, for me, like, national champs is, like, the only race, really, that I've done in, like, every year for the mm. last few years. Um, and I really, I wanted to do good there. I know, like, Johnny and the whole Lusty family, like, that was a pretty important race for them, like, because they have a pretty big presence there. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that was, like, a bit of a downer that night. But, you know, it is what it is. Um but because I'd like put so much pressure on myself and I was so in my own head about like not feeling confident, like I didn't just like dumb shit. I was like, Oh my butt, like my bike doesn't feel good. It feels the exact same as last time you rode it. You just like, I was just weak and just not, not having that good of a time. Um, so then after I like watched the video back and I was like, I definitely like smashed my head into the ground. So I was like, I'm not like, I'm just not going to race. Um, and then I just like got um like I just kind of got amongst it in the pits like mm. and I actually had the Saturday which was race day I had a way better day than I had any other day when I was there um or Friday night really because I think whip off was Friday night right yeah Saturday no? after, Saturday. okay after okay. finals so, yeah <clears throat> um yeah I just was like sweet well I'm here like I'm not just gonna go home my flight mm. isn't until Monday anyway. I was like, how can I like make the most of this situation? Which I feel like is what I'm doing with my wrist, but we'll get we'll get to that later. But yeah, I was like, I can't race. Like my head's not 
so bad that like it's too much to be around people. Um, I didn't, it was probably like a, a, a call I made to not race was like more on the tentative side than anything. Like mm. I didn't, I didn't necessarily have concussion symptoms that were like that prominent, but for me, just like watching the video of me landing on my head, I was like, it was pretty bad. Probably, <laughs> probably best to play it safe. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was like, cool. I was getting amongst it. So I did like the TOD bike, like the Australian account, like Instagram mm-hmm. takeover. I did like a few other little bits of media here and there. Um, and yeah, just got amongst the event and it was like, it was really sick. I had mm-hmm. an awesome day just like talking to people, hanging out. Like, yeah, it was sick. I, I've never, never gotten to like actually experienced cannibal festival in that way. Mm. Um, I've like been once and not raced when I had a broken ankle, but I'm pretty sure I just sat in the tram pits most of the time because I couldn't really like get around very well and just drank beers with Dylan. So it was cool just like going and watching, like getting amongst the crowd, like heckling, mm. yeah, you know, doing whatever. And then um, they invited me to judge the whip off, which was like highlight of my week pretty much. And, um, yeah, cause it was sponsored by Dady. So they were like, well, you're a Dady athlete. Do you want to sponsor, do you want to, um, judge the whip off? I was like, yep, yeah, sweet. I've judged it before. Um, sign me up kind of thing. Like whatever I can do, I'll do. And I walked up the judging tower and I was like, <laughs> didn't know who was judging. Had no idea. I was like, I'll probably just like be me and Timmy and maybe like Kai or something like it was last time I judged. <laughs> Get up there and like. Um, who was there? Minara and Petey were there, weren't they? And um, newly the whole set, the whole syndicate were there. But yeah, um, yeah, get up the thing and like Minara's just like sitting on the judging couch. He's like the only person up there, and I was like, oh, hi. <laughs> I was like pretty starstruck. I was like, no, holy M- shit, Minara was starstruck. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was like, this is pretty cool. So I like, sat down. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't drinking beers with, um, in that moment I wish that I was able to drink but um, yeah sat down it was just like having a, just general chats with Manar we are talking about Joshy Proper and um, turns out Manar's Proper's biggest fan <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was like that I was like that's pretty cool and then um, yeah then Newly walked up I was like sweet and then Turn around, Petey's up there. I was like, fuck, this is pretty hectic. I'm just like sitting on a couch between Petey <laughs> and Manar, judging a whip off, just talking shit. I was like, this is this is cool as. Um, so yeah, that was like definitely the highlight. Watching Patty Butler just like just oh. absolutely go for it. Um and then yeah, that was yeah, it was a sick event. I was absolutely frothing. That was Probably one of the best whip offs I've ever seen. Like Leroy's fronty was dumb. That was yeah, silly. yeah. As far as far as like cannonball whip offs go, I reckon that was like definitely up there with one of the best ones for and sure. Some of the ladies, man, they were throwing so hard. It was yeah. wild. <clears throat> I reckon this is the first. Well, forgive me if I'm wrong, but this is the first year I remember, like at least in Australia going to a whip off and there was like more than two girls. Mm, it wasn't just Caro and Has. Yeah, exactly. And there was like, yeah, some chicks doing forgive me for not remembering your names, but there was like some girls doing some fucking legitimate whips. It was sick. And young, um, like yeah. 16, 17 year old. And that was yeah. yeah. That's a yeah. big jump to whip. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Um so yeah, that was sick. And then being able to award like yeah, I got to award the prizes for the whip off at the end, yeah. which was pretty sweet as well. Yeah. Gave gave the winners their um custom dady battle vests. So Did, we, uh, um, oh mate, one didn't he? He broke his collar. Yeah. yeah, so Pat was like, we called his dad and we're like, oh, just letting you know, Pat's won. Um, who do you want us to send the like prizes home with? And they were in the they were in the ambulance, but they were still at Threadbow, they hadn't left yet. 
<laughs> so Paddy was like, oh, sweet, I've won. So he got himself out of the ambulance, came and like stood on the podium like a fucking champion and then got, <laughs> got back in the ambulance and went and sorted himself out. We need more Paddy Weller. Let's, let's be honest. Yeah. The, yeah, we the, need world needs, the world needs more of that. He is yeah. such a lord. Yeah, I was stoked just to see him like, I was sharing a room with him that week in the Lusty house and I was like, I didn't know that he was even coming because um, I didn't know that he's still – I feel like he's still been like racing kind of, but I just didn't know that he was going to be there. And I like walked up the stairs to my room and I was like, fuck yeah, P-Bucks here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure his bike had more cracks in it than it did Wells as well. Like that thing he's was still, – He's still riding the Bergamot from back in the Bergamot days. Uh, it's – yeah, and it's so cracked. It's yeah, wow. Well, more cracked now. <laughs> yeah, he definitely didn't land straight. No, not once. Um, he landed landed straight enough though. Yeah, he won. Who cares? That's it. <laughs> uh, you went back to NZ, did Roto and stuff after that. But uh, yes. at what point did the vital raw talk come into play? Because that was fucking sick. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's something I've wanted to do like forever since like I remember being a grom and just watching like <laughs> the old like Adam Brayton, like Vital Roars, and then like obviously all the Vital Roars from the World Cups and like <laughs> just thinking oh like the sickest video ever. Um that how did that come about? I think it was after Magaza Fest. Um Brian, who's an American fella who turns out he works for Vital. For Vital. I didn't actually okay. know that at the time, but um, <clears throat> he just sent me a couple of clips from Magazza Fest from the Dream Track Jam. Mm-hmm. And then I'd like followed him on Instagram for ages and we'd like kind of spoken before, but I didn't, I, like, I didn't know him. Um, so, yeah, he sent me some clips and... I I just hit him up and I was like, hey man, like I've seen you've done some stuff for Vital. I know that he'd like filmed a Vital Roar before. I know he'd ridden in a Vital Roar before, like over the years. And I was like, how do these things work? Like, do I just get a filmer and go film one and then submit it and hope that, you know, hope that you post it? Or like, do you guys reach out to athletes and say, hey, we want to film a Vital Roar? Like, how does this work? Like, I have no idea. Um, and he pretty much got back to me and was like, there, there's no turns out there's not really like a particular formula it's like a bit of everything but um he was like i work for vital like i i pretty much have like the key to just film them whenever i want with whoever i want and mm. it was like i'd be hell keen to do one with you so we just got stuck into it pretty much well i say we got stuck into it but yeah we, we plan to do it we um we filmed for like an afternoon in the bike park, did like literally two laps down the skyline on my downhill bike in the afternoon. Hmm. And then, um, and then that was like right after, um, summer series, maybe. I think so. And then I got really sick. Hmm. Um, we were supposed to film it all in that one week because he was leaving Queenstown. Yeah. Um, yeah, then I got like real sick, so I couldn't. We tried to go film Coronet, and I was like, "Nah, dude." <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it was it was real windy that day, so I didn't feel as bad. But I was like, "I fucking can't do this." Um. So then we kind of just like he was traveling with his girlfriend around New Zealand, and they were kind of just bouncing off of Queenstown every so often. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So we just had to time it to be like, sweet, well, I'm going to be back from, we film, we finished filming it after Rotorua, um, mm-hmm. but we started filming it like, yeah, in like February or March, like mm-hmm. weeks before. Um, took us like over a month to actually film it, but the actual filming time was probably about one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> All classic. Combined. Um, so yeah, we just had to time it for like when we were both there and free. Um, and then went out like one afternoon after I'd finished work at the cafe and went and filmed some stuff at Dream. And then 
were kind of like, oh, it would be pretty sick to get like a trail bike segment in there. Mm. Um, so then, yeah, we sp- spent like, it was af- yeah, after I drew. So I had seven speed on my trail bike. So I was like, I can't really go trail riding, but how about like we'll go up Queenstown Hill where most of the time you like push up anyway because the climb mm. is just like fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I went up there and like that whole trail bike segment, everything in it except for the jump at the end which i like sessioned a fair bit like all those rock rolls all like the slappy corners and everything that was the first time it, like first time i'd ridden any of it was like we just did like one take of yeah. everything and that was the first time i'd ridden any of it so that's wild um yeah that was like i remember one bit it was like a clip where i come into shot and I'm like sliding like into like a little catch berm. And then it's kind mm-hmm. of like kind of like scandy, like flicky little between berms, like past the camera. Yeah. And then if you watch like pretty closely, I like jump on the anchors pretty hard, like just before the um shot finishes. And I had obviously had no idea what was coming up. We just stopped further up. Brian had like ridden the track like maybe twice or something. Yeah. <clears throat> And he was like, oh, I'm pretty sure there's some corners down here. Like, I'll just go set up and, like, you just come past. Kind of thing. Like, <laughs> you do you. <laughs> I was like, sweet. And, like, as I was coming into the first turn, I was like, oh, fuck, yeah. Like, these look like sick little ruts. So that went pretty hard. And then they did, the ruts just finished. And I was like, fuck, and just grabbed, like, a handful of brakes because I'd see, like, a drop or something coming up. <laughs> like, pretty much just crashed into the bushes, like, just out of shot. And then... <laughs> looked at like what the drop was that I saw kind of it was just like a full rock roll. Okay. <laughs> like, if, like if I had have gone off that at speed, like I would have been absolutely fucked. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, it was like pretty loose way of filming because like I don't like to I don't I don't want like any clips to go into anything that I'm not stoked on. So like I'm gonna go mm. as hard as I can. And um yeah, riding like a pretty high consequence trail on my trail bike that I'd never ridden before and filming it was like pretty full on. But um yeah, I'm stoked on how that thing came out. Yeah, it was sick to watch. I was really happy to watch that and wanted to <laughs> yeah. go right afterwards. That's perfect. I, I just like wanted yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to make sure that I got like a pretty good mix of everything. Mm-hmm. Ideally I would have filmed some stuff at Gorge, but I wasn't really feeling like I was, I didn't feel very comfortable at Gorge yet. Yeah, um, that looks like a whole yeah. different beast. Yeah, it's like I don't know. If I had my BMX there, I probably would have been sweet. But um, mm. took me like pretty much the entire summer. Took me pretty much until I got back home, and then I put some different bars on my dirt jump bike to okay. actually start feeling comfy on it. Um, so yeah, kind of scrapped that, but I was happy. We still got some bike park stuff, got some down and bike stuff, got some trail bike stuff, some like tech stuff. And then mm. obviously the my, my favorite section is the dream track section for We're sure. Boosting to the moon. <laughs> yeah. I wish that I'd started flipping stuff whilst we were filming. Cause mm. that would have been a nice little addition. Like the no foot can that's the ender was like, I learned no, well, I say I learned no foot cans. I've done like a handful over the years, mm. but never really like, learn them to the point where they were on lock. Like every time I do them, I have to relearn them, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I relearned no foot cans on that jump whilst we were filming because I was like, fuck, I need something cool to like end with. Mm. <laughs> and the shot that we thought of was like from that top side angle. I was like, well, if I take my hand off, it's like the other hand and I've already done a tire grab. I was like, if I do a toboggan, like it's the other hand. Like mm. not, none of the tricks that I already had in the bag worked for that angle. So I was mm. like, oh, fuck. like maybe I could do a no foot can, like I've done a couple. And that, I think that one that went in the video, was that second one I did. <laughs> so sick. Is, yeah. Pretty sick. Pretty pumped on it. <laughs> and then you end up at Cairns pretty much. Or you came down to Melbourne, right? And did some work. Yeah. So had like three weeks in um queenstown after rotorua which mm-hmm. the fir- first week of that we like knocked that vital roar out of the way then 
started training for the biggest race of the year, which was Wakatipu World Champs, which is like <laughs> um, the so Vertigo bikes, like the bike shop in Queenstown, they've been running a like just like a local club series forever. Um, yeah, like four or five rounds over summer, which I managed to miss every single one of them. <laughs> Um, just because I was like away or at a different event or I was in Rotorua or whatever. Um, but then, yeah, I was around for the final one, which was they just like put world champs on. Like your race plate has like the world champ stripes and everything on it. Like it's pretty <laughs> funny. Um, biggest race for bragging rights in New Zealand, it feels like. Um, and, yeah, managed to come away with the gold, which – to be to be completely honest, I was like very surprised with, and I, um, yeah, I, I think what helped me was that I practiced different to everyone else. Um, most other people had raced the track before, and there was definitely like some pretty fast boys there. Um, it was the same track that they raced for the summer series last year, which you would have okay. seen. It was wet and it was also crate day, so it was like yep. pretty loose. Um, they only raced it before, but aside from that, like most of the track is closed off generally. Um, and it was also school holidays. It was also the end of Easter, and they're also renovating the gondola. So. <laughs> With that, having a race on and like the basically, long story short, the lift queue was fucked. <laughs> yeah. Um, took you like I, I got in line to do my first run before the lift opened. And by the time I got to the start of the track, it was like halfway through practice already. Shit. Um, took me like an hour and 20 minutes to get up there. But the, the track was short. They only used like a half of the hill. So it's, it stopped like just below like midway at, in the bike park. Mm-hmm. So I was broken into two sections and just like practiced the top half and then just did push runs, like pretty old school approach, just like yeah. pushed back up the fire road, did another run, pushed back up the fire road, did another run, sessions and bits, did another run of that half and then did like, I think I did like six runs of the top half plus like a few session bits. And mm-hmm. until I was like, fuck yeah, this is pretty dialed. And also I was like, oh, I'm halfway through the half of practice that I have left. Um, and then moved on to the bottom bit. And so I did the same there, like session bits and just did push runs, did like four and a half laps of the bottom or whatever. And then pushed right back up and did a full top to bottom practice run and then went and lined up for my race run pretty much. Um, <clears throat> and everybody else did like, maybe two runs mm. that were separated by like, you know, an hour in between each one. Um, so I think I practiced quite well and like I was taking this shit fucking serious. Everyone was there like, <laughs> ah, whatever, it doesn't matter. But I was like, I'm here to win. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, like I felt pretty good on the bike. I'd like made some changes, which felt nice. Like, I thought that I had too low of a front end like all summer and I kept like raising it up and being like, yeah, that feels better. But then just before um, that race, I just like took like 10 mil or like 15 mil out of my stack height, just like dropped, slammed my bars and was like, fuck, I've been going the wrong way. Like I needed <laughs> my bars to be lower. <laughs> um, so yeah, they just like felt pretty, pretty good on the bike. I had a, Knowing that, like, my I had a history over the summer of, like, my qualifying run being, like, real good mm. um, and my race run being dog shit. Um, and this this race format was, like, one run, win it or bin it. Like, no seeding, yes. like, self-seeded, one <laughs> run, winner takes all kind of thing. <laughs> um, so because of that, I was like, oh, sweet. Like, I know that I have the ability to put down a good qualifying run. So I um, made my qualifying run a race run and didn't feel like I did anything special. Just, like, rode really well from top to bottom. And 
through the bottom shoot, I was like, hey, I didn't feel that fast, didn't feel that slow, whatever. And like a few other people that mentioned, they're like, oh, you didn't look like anything special. Like my friends that will just <laughs> tell me how it is. They're like, yeah, whatever. I was like, oh, I had fun. Like, sweet, cool is what it is. And they're calling out the podium and I was like, when they called out second and or third and second, I was like, oh, yeah, no, nah, like I'm out the back kind of thing. And then, yeah, lo and behold, <laughs> fucking number one, baby. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, that was that pretty cool way. And then I think for the next week or something, I left Queenstown. So it was like pretty, that was like a pretty sick way to finish off my summer there. Yeah. Even though that race means nothing, it like for me, it meant everything. It was like <laughs> just a nice little like cherry on top. Mm. And for me, it was nice to go and like just use it as a practice race, basically. Um, and have everything actually work out and yeah. take home a gold black like, gold medal at the end of it. Was world like, champs jersey. <laughs> well, didn't get a jersey, but um yeah, got a world champs trophy and a medal and um <laughs> the and bragging rights. That's so, all that matters, all right? All that matters. I think I, the cool I, it was pretty sick actually. The um Atlas like Atlas beer cafe like the bar that they help out um they sponsored the event and like they help out with the mountain bike club and like in return most like that's the place you go for a beer after mm-hmm. kind of thing like um i booked a table there yeah a few days after just for like some leaving drinks and dinner and paul instead of putting my name on the reservation we just like rocked up to a table and had a reservation sign that just said Wakatipu World Champ. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was like pretty cool. <laughs> sounds like what type of players. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was pretty sweet. But uh, yeah. Then I came home, went and worked in Omeo for a bit because I was pretty broke all summer, but I was very broke at that point. And I was like, fuck, I need to figure out how to um, afford to go overseas for the, <laughs> the rest <laughs> of the Frankfurt season. So, yeah. But surely while you're over there winning, you know, world champs and competing in Roto and doing all that stuff, you're earning millions, right? You're a pro yep. rider. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you reckon that trip cost? Is that interest? Um, fuck. 30 grand, mm. probably. That's about right. Yeah. Like, and that's like living pretty on the cheap. Mm. Um, yeah, probably something like that. I reckon. Yeah. I remember I did. I remember when I was like, um, when I kind of got to a point where I was like, fuck, I got to ask. Like, I need some serious help from dad to like pay rent <laughs> here. Um, I I was like, hey, like asking me if I could borrow some money, and he was just like, he's like basically like, is there another option? Like, have you, you know, making sure I'd thought about it, it wasn't just like, oh fuck, dad, help, need money. Um, and I like sat down and wrote a budget for the the next month that I was planning on being there, which included, um, this is like just before Rotorua, I think, so it included going to Rotorua, mm. and. Yeah, I like worked out the budget and was just like, holy fuck. It was still like, it was going to be like another 12 grand or something just for like the last month I was there, including like flights to Rotorua, like my entries for Roto, my, yeah, like everything else, and then a flight home at the end. Mm. So, um, yeah, it was fucking pretty expensive. And Queenstown's just like an expensive place to live, full stop. Yeah, it looks ruthless. Yeah, cost, cost of living there is high. Rent isn't actually ridiculous. Like I was just looking at just like rentals in the Gold Coast, like just mm-hmm. to get an idea. And like print, it's like a, a similar price there for a room as it is in Queenstown. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but like groceries are more expensive. Um, like fuels like double the price. Yeah, right. Your like hourly rate if you're working, like wages are lower. Mm, of course. 
Um, but yeah, it's pretty ruthless. So you had to come back and then just work your ass off for three weeks in Omeo? Yeah, I went and worked in Omeo um, for Common Ground Trails, just helped out there. I, I kind of come back and was like, um, asked for a, a bit of a pay rise on what I've been earning previously with other companies. Um, but I was like, in return for that, like I'm not going to be picky on what I'm doing. Because yeah. if I can like earn some good money, I'll do, I'll build whatever you need me to build, kind of thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, I went and worked there for like three weeks. Which by the time I got back and actually got stuck into that, I was like, fuck, three weeks isn't actually that much. I thought like I had more time, <laughs> and then yep, and then pretty much spent like most of what I earned there on going to Cairns. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, was planning on coming back, working for another three weeks and then selling my downer bike. So I just got a fresh downer bike. Um, and I don't know, that was supposed to fund <laughs> going to Innsbruck, but yeah, like, I don't know, it was a bit of a silver lining and breaking my wrist in cans. Cause like now I'm not really financially stressed anymore. Um, I'm not going to put myself in more debt. And um, I've got time to just like sit down and make a pretty dialed plan for next year. So what actually uh, what actually happened when you broke your wrist? Because, I mean, you did a pretty sick fast plant, but then just missed the top of the berm. But what happened like before <laughs> that? Did your forks like compress hard or? Hmm. Still nothing that out. I, um. I think my forks blew up. Mm. Um, but like my bikes are still on their way back. I just got them like road freighted thanks to pump and pedals and cans for sorting that out for me. Um, it cost me like only like a hundred bucks more than what it would to take them on the plane. Yeah. It's fuck all different. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so they're still on the way back. So I'm kind of keen to like have a look at my bike and investigate the fork situation. Um, but basically that left hander, like Martha Gill crashed there as well. Like a few other people had some pretty hectic moments in that turn. Um, and there was just like a little greasy patch, just like greasy yeah. clay. Um, and it was right at like where you pushed in and that, from the shadow of everything like that bit just like didn't really get sun. Like mm-hmm. I went and looked at it the day after and it was still greasy. Obviously they haven't watered it in the past 24 hours because the event was over, but um, just a bit of a greasy patch. I'm not saying that's all to blame. Like I rode down that lane multiple times before it and mm-hmm. I didn't crash. So, and so did heaps of other people, but um, it's, I think that crash started before that run even took place. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. So I'd like, I kind of, I'd done, I'd completed my goal for speed and style, which was like make it into the top eight, make it on TV, went against Mike Ross and I was like, fuck, got to pull out the big ones here. <laughs> so you didn't um, do any cashies or? <laughs> I did my first flip X up against Mike Ross. I've never done like a flip combo ever Sick. in my life. Yeah. Um, well, he was doing well, cashy like, combos next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I had him. Well, I knew I had him like, I knew I had him covered on speed. I was like, I have to like try and put in like the max time differential of like two seconds. And then I was like trying to do the maths in my head of like what my tricks that I'd already done were worth. And I was like, fuck, that's only like a second. So if I do a flip X up, maybe it'll like, like mm-hmm. if I, I don't, I think if I hadn't have crashed on that 360, it would have been like fucking close as to who went mm. through. Um, but anyway. But he's still so, fast, like, to put a second into him, still pretty pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I was, I felt like I was hauling ass on that. Yeah. On that yeah. Like, oh, you um, can actually ride. <laughs> turns out. <laughs> yeah. um, so, but in my head anyway, I was like, I was kind of like, sweet. Like, the rest of the week is like all events that I'm kind of comfortable with because like that was the scariest, like, feels like the, mm. the least 
balanced risk versus reward factor. I was like, for a little bit, I was like, fuck speed and stuff. This event sucks. I've kind of like grown to, <laughs> yeah. to love it now. But anyway, um, so after that was done, I was like, cool. I've like achieved a goal for the week already. I was like, the rest of the week is kind of like safe. I was like, dual slalom. Like I know that I can push in that event, but you know, nothing catastrophic is going to happen. Um, turns out. And then like, I felt good on the downhill track and pump track. I was like, I'm just doing that for like points for the overall basically. So I was like, cool. Like we're on for the rest of the week. Um, and then in my first qualifying run, I, um, for dual slalom, I like missed the timing beam at the end. So they had like, yeah. The way the flags were set up, um, they finished like uh, the timing beams were like offset in the finish corral, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. like the left-hand lane, the timing beam was like right against the fence. And mm-hmm. then there was like the middle beam. And then the timing beam for the right-hand lane was like two meters in from the fence. Um, and obviously I'd practiced it. And like I said before, like it's, on me because there's plenty of other people that didn't do what I did. Um, and I know I just like went around the flags, went like left or sorry, right, left, right. And then just like turned too much right and went around the wrong side of the timing beam and then had to like stop and walk back around. I think Dylan Crane did the same thing. <laughs> um, so I was like off the, I was like 29th after my first qualifying run, I was like, fuck, I got to like claw back some time somehow. So I just lined myself up against um, Bass, my yeah. second qualifying run. And I was like, I don't know if I'll beat him or whatever. It doesn't matter if I beat him, but at least if I've got someone that I know is like contending for the win lined up next to me and I can just try and hold him that mm. I'll like put down a good time and hopefully get like a better matchup for my first um, round of 32 or whatever. So I was like pushing like hard as fuck in my second qualifying run to try and claw back a bit of time. And like, as you can see, like in the video, like coming into those final turns, I was like, right. I was, I was with Bass. So like, obviously I was like on a pretty good pace. Mm. Um, I just pushed into that turn and I watching it back, like the way that how violently I got flung, I I think that potentially my forks have like exploded, like the rebound adjustments like gone or something. Cause it just like sprung me back like a pogo mm-hmm. stick. But from what it felt like, luckily I didn't hit my head in this one. Um, I, I pushed into the turn and I like my front started to go. So I started like adjusting my weight distribution to like account for that. Mm. But then it like, Instant that like gripped up, obviously, because it sure did moved <laughs> past the the slippery boy. <laughs> gripped up, and then like my weight was just in the wrong spot, and it just fucking spat me. Like, yeah, just flung me. Um, I don't know. Can you like for the for the video version of this podcast? Can we be playing that right now? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, like pushed in, tucked front a little bit. Then it gripped up and then like my weight. But like I've watched like frame by frame from the live stream like replay that they put on, which shout out Red Bull TV for still giving me some screen time even <laughs> yeah. though I didn't even make it to the finals. It's probably um, more interesting than the finals, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I counted. I still had like a minute and a half of screen time of them just yeah. being like, ah, oh, back to crashed. God damn it. Um, but anyway, I've like watched that angle and like, and also the angle from the back that I posted. Mm. And you can see like the whole time I'm crashing, my head and shoulders and shit are like still going into the next turn and like looking mm. through the next corner, like as if my brain was like, I got this. I still got this. <laughs> <laughs> you're flying <laughs> over the burn and you're still <laughs> looking around. <laughs> yeah, like right until like I'm fully off the bike, like I'm like compressed up like over the front of the bike and my head and everything is like looking through the next turn and I'm just like, you don't got this, but kudos for thinking you do. But <laughs> um, so yeah, anyway, chewed me up, spat me out. And that was, that's me done for the rest of the year, pretty much. <laughs> it, 
It reminded me of like Col- there's this footage of Colin McRae and he crashes his rally car and as he's rolling, he shifts into first. Yeah. <laughs> like, he knows he'll probably land flat and just be ready to go. And you're yep. always like in the corner. Just like, yeah, we're on, we're on. Oh, no, we don't got this. Um, but yeah, I, until I watched the video, I um, I thought that I like, I thought I was in a completely different position to what I was when I hit the top of that berm. Mm. I thought my feet had like gone over first and I'd like put my hands out like underneath my butt mm. and, and that I'd like back slapped the top of the berm and then fell off. Yeah, no. But turns out I was like on my stomach and I just put my hand out funny. You can see like exactly yeah. where my wrist dislocated in the video. Um, and then, yeah, I was just laying on the ground and holding my wrist and then the medic came over and they were like, oh, you know, what's wrong? And I was like, I've dislocated my wrist. And they were like, <laughs> oh, well, we'll take you to the medic tent and we'll find out. I was like, no, I was like, look, it's dislocated. And they were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love um, that moment, hey. It, yeah, it's so yeah. good. So that was that pretty much. Luckily, like, I don't know, I kind of don't really want to dive into the whole hospital bullshit, but I'll give you a quick brief overview. Um, they kept me there for the weekend. Luckily, they let me out to go watch the event still, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, did like a little interview during the downhill live stream, if That's anyone saw it. Yeah. Um, so that was pretty cool. Got to see. Actually got to see in the broadcast truck. Oh, sick. Fucking hectic. Yeah, it doesn't look chill. Now I understand why they can't just have unlimited cameras on course. Yeah. Because like they literally have like a screen in there for every single camera and a person that mans every single screen. And there's like it looks like a control panel out of a movie. And there's a dude being like, camera two, pan up, camera three, get ready to zoom out as the rider comes for and it's just Fucking hectic. Um, yeah, so that was still pretty cool. Got to like at least experience the event. Then Monday, um, I get surgery on Tuesday, I think. Mm. It was Wednesday. Anyway, um, I actually had the same surgeon operate on me who fixed my right wrist when I crashed there at the <laughs> World Cup back in 2016. Um, He's like, which, you still haven't learned to ride yet, have you? <laughs> <clears throat> well, he... It was like best case scenario because um he is a fan of the sport. He is a mountain biker himself. He was I saw him at World Championships when we were there. I saw him at Crankworks last year. Like he always comes and watches the event. Like um he was there when I crashed. Like he walked over to the medic tent with me and was like, sweet, well, like I'll I'll help you sort this out. He's um he's actually works in a private practice, but he came like I, I asked for him to do my surgery, not knowing that he was in a private practice. I don't have private health insurance, which I'm going to now. Um, but yeah, he came and did my surgery in the public system so that it wouldn't cost me. Um, and yeah, so just knowing that like he's a mountain biker, he understands like when I say that I'm going to return to bike riding, he knows what that means. Um, so that was like best case scenario. Um, because before we confirmed that they were just going to send me back to Melbourne and be like, just go to the ED. We'll send you with your x-rays and um, sort yourself out. And I was like, fuck, I don't really, not very excited about that. Um, so, yeah. yeah shout out, yeah, shout no. out Dr. Dr. Loveridge. <laughs> um, anyone in Cairns that needs their wrist fixed, hit him up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so he did my surgery, spent like another day there or whatever, and then flew home. And here I am. Sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And another wrist. Yeah. But it, like watching that, like it looked pretty brutal. You could have got so much worse. I, I saw yeah, your head hit and I was like, fuck. Yeah. I think my head, my head definitely like hit the ground, but I think it was more the visor of my helmet. Mm. And because I had so much like, forwards momentum it kind of and more so just like i don't know brushed past yeah you like skimmed it like i didn't actually like have any impact on well it didn't doesn't feel like i had any impact like on the actual Mm. ground which is good um but yeah the 
the diagnosis is that I had a, um, I can't remember what, what it's actually called, but it's a, a dis, like a lunate dislocation, um, which means my wrist kind of like moved like forwards and up and was like sitting on top of my, on top of the end of my um, radius and ulna. Sick. So, but my, the lunate bone, which is like the one in the center of all your hand bones next to your scaphoid, um, that stayed in place. So mm. that means all of the ligaments surrounding that, like that attached to my scaphoid, that attached to everything else, all tore. Um, I cracked the lunate in half and, or not quite in half, but close enough. And the end of like, that bit of bone that broke off flipped like totally upside down. Sick. Um, I fractured the end of my radius, um, and I also fractured my scaphoid. And when the ligaments pulled off of my ulna, they like took some bone fragments with it. Um, so long story short, my wrist just exploded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's like a yeah, microwave that... lasagna, just completely yeah. thrown on yeah. the floor right now. Yeah. Pretty much, eh? Um, yeah, they, they put it back in on the Friday night and then, yeah, had surgery that following week. Um, and now I have, whilst they were operating on it, apparently they had to re-dislocate my wrist so they could get, like, a good angle to flip the bits of bone back around and screw them back on. Um, Dr. Loveridge said that he had some screws air freighted up from Brisbane because they didn't have screws small enough there. <laughs> um, to like screw he could have just gone to Bunnings. Yeah, screw my lunate and everything back together. Um, so now I have a bunch of wires holding my hand stable while the ligaments regrow, and then I have a plate in there which I think is going to stay in, and then that's like on my radius. And then um, I also have some screws, yeah, in my scaphoid and some screws in my lunate, which I think they'll stay in. So in like eight weeks, I get the wires taken out um went to the hand therapist this morning and she was like pretty happy with how much movement i've like mm -hmm. been able to maintain like in my fingers and stuff um so yeah in i think in like three weeks once i get the stitches out i can start like actually moving my wrist apparently um i can't do any physio but like i can kind of just at least Oof. gently move it <laughs> Um, which is earlier than I expected, but I'm I'm thinking this whole process is going to be you know three three months or longer before I'll be back like competing at least. Yeah, I'd say yeah, it's pretty brutal. Yeah, but because I, like my main focus for this year was crankworks, and I can't do yeah. either of the crankworks events. So, um, I this is a this is the first time where I've had like nothing to rush back for. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so it's going to take as much time as I need. If that means I'm off the bike for a bunch of months, that then so be it. But like, just going to yeah take my time, get it back a hundred percent, and then once it's back at a hundred percent, go hard from there. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Sounds like a good plan. Yeah. 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 Go win world champs in, <laughs> in Roto again. Yeah, I want to. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I did just enough this year in like in the crankworks circuit to kind of like establish my name in that scene, but also for me to know which bits of which events I suck at, um, and and quite specifically how I can train for them. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty excited for, for crankworks next year. Like I feel like with a full summer of like pretty focused training, um, I'll, yeah, I'll be able to come back and, and be like pretty competitive straight away. Hopefully see what happens. <laughs> How have your sponsors been with like the crash and pretty much wiping your season out? Like that's. Big party plans, I guess. Big party of selling points for most sponsors. Um, no one's really said anything yet. Like I actually saw, so random. I saw Johnny from Lusty um, 
in the lobby of the hotel that I stayed in the night before I flew out from Cairns on his way to the airport as I was checking out to go to the airport myself. And I didn't know that he was up there. He wasn't at the event. He was actually um, doing like a adventure bike tour from Cairns to Cape York or something. Yep. Um, and he was on his way back from that. I had no fucking idea. So that was pretty random. But, um, yeah, I got to talk to him. Like he's, he's all cool with it. Um, Daryl's like Daryl from Canyon. He's supported me through a bunch of injuries over the years. So I, I doubt there's any hard feelings there, but, um, I'm like pretty keen to make sure that like I use this time as wisely as I can both to like get my wrist sorted and kind of maintain some kind of training, but also to put myself into some situations that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to. So planning on like going to some local state races, like I'm going to go to King the second round of King of Ballarat in a few weeks um, and just like stay involved in the scene, but just in a dis- different capacity. So um, I won't be racing obviously, but you know, if there's the ability to take some grommets for, you know, a track walk at a VDHS or to like, uh, I've been toying with some ideas for like some fun little events, which I'm not going to say too much more on in case nothing ever happens. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm still like trying to stay as active as I can. And if anything, it gives me an opportunity to to be more involved in like, the local community than mm. I otherwise would have been. So I think with that kind of stuff and with like some cool content ideas that I have that I can still do one handed, like um Only fans. Yeah, I think, <laughs> hey. Only <laughs> fans. <laughs> I think um yeah with all that kind of stuff like I'll I'll still be able to like provide as much value to all of my sponsors as mm. if I was going overseas racing. It'll just be yeah, just in a different capacity I suppose. You're not going to be working for a while, so you're going to have heaps of free time. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Common Ground have kind of offered for me to, I don't know if I should say this, but uh, I'm going to. Um, They've offered for me to come up to Omeo like a few days a week or however much like I kind of feel like I can um, just to do some training with the crew because they've got, got a pretty big team on up there and and just with the nature of any trail building company in a place like with a project like that in a remote place, like you're just going to end up with a fair few staff that are like inexperienced. Like maybe it's their first mm. time doing it professionally or they're just locals that actually have no trail building experience. Mm. So um, whilst I can't operate a machine or something, they've yeah kindly offered for me to just come up there and, and do a few days training with the crew. So I can kind of still work a little bit. Um, yeah. But I'm just waiting until I'm not in pain before I make any decisions on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all well, the painkillers, like you're not in pain and the painkillers wear off. Like, oh, I'm actually in pain. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I haven't really been been trying not to take the painkillers because they just make me feel shit. So, mm. um, and I'm not in heaps of pain, but it's like it's uncomfortable enough that I wouldn't want to be out in the cold on site yeah. for eight hours. <laughs> Fair yeah. Sick dude, uh, should we start wrapping things up? Yeah, how long have we been going for? About an hour and ten. Oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just a short one. Yeah, easy. <laughs> um, what are we gonna talk about? Uh, I guess like this might be a cool one. Um, mm. what advice would you give to someone that's freshly injured, and how to kind of stay positive and focus on some positivity <laughs> when you're injured? just like at the start because it's pretty fresh for you, right? Been yeah. Um, a week. Of, of the, uh, yeah, two weeks. Hmm. Oh, a week and a half, two weeks, I don't know, whatever it is. Um, fuck, where do you even start with that? I've obviously had a few injuries over the years, so um, it seems like every sort of three years I have a, a <laughs> decent one. <laughs> um, You're going to pay taxes, dude. <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel like for me, the hardest bit that like gets me down is like, it's really nice to have a bunch of messages from people checking in or whatever, but they're also like the worst 
bit sometimes when it people being like, oh man, it sucks that you got hurt or like, ah, oh, spewing for you, like, ah, oh, it sucks or whatever. It's like, well, it was actually not really that down about it, but yeah, well, now you mention it, it does kind of suck. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. So it's kind of like filtering that stuff, but um, I've always managed to kind of stay positive and the, the best way that I've ever been able to do that with like any situation, whether it be an injury or, you know, you get fired from your job or fucking whatever it is. Like there's all, I feel like there's always some kind of silver lining to it. So um, whilst it hasn't exactly presented itself right now, um, there's some, there's already some things that I've like, put my foot in the door of and opportunities that I wouldn't have otherwise even had the option to explore that. Uh, unfortunately, I can't say anything about these, but uh, well, not yet anyway, but yeah, there's some like really exciting things that I wouldn't have otherwise even, they wouldn't have even crossed my path. So I feel like you can always make the most out of any situation and there's always some kind of silver lining to be found. Um, so as long as you just like try and yeah, try and make the most of like just because I'm home now and I can't ride doesn't mean like I can't go and do stuff. Mm. Um there's always like something else that you can like focus your energy into or like something that you've been ignoring for ages because you hadn't haven't had time because you've been riding that now like all of a sudden you've got time to go and do that thing or like go and see that place that you wanted to go on so whatever it is like there's always something else to look forward to um mm. that's like yeah that's how i get through things i feel like i just rambled for a bit there but no makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah yeah just yeah just knowing that like just because one door shut like doesn't mean that you can't just open the one next to it and go and explore yeah. that kind of thing see what happens yeah yeah see what happens like take everything with like a pretty open mind and like yeah, I can't go race crankworks, but yeah, there's some pretty cool other opportunities that I'm now going to be home for. And who knows through like going to the local races, I might meet somebody that knows somebody that mm-hmm. opens up another door or, you know, whatever it is, like there's always going to be something else to look forward to. So, um, yeah. 100%. And uh, last question, what do you mean digging music wise? Like, had anything good? That one's been. I've been going like actually exploring a fair bit. Still the still the classic, like yeah. just a bit of like nineties punk, but um been listening to obviously by default being Queenstown, got sucked into the drum and bass <laughs> a little bit. Yep. Mainly just like some liquid kind of drum and bass stuff. Mm. <laughs> um and kind of going back down like the 90s kind of old school hip-hop route. So like Del Funky Homo Sapien and like that kind of, yes, yeah, yes. that kind of vibe a little bit more again, just like some cruisier stuff. Um, but yes, on top of that, there's a whole bunch. Like I just drove to Omeo and back yesterday to get like some of my stuff. Like I left my iPad and stuff. And mm. for most of the way there, I was just listening to like ACDC and Motorhead. Hey. <laughs> Classic, yeah. yeah. ACDC radio on Spotify. Most yeah, I've played got by a, Baxter. Yeah, yeah. I've got a playlist called. Um, oh, I'm gonna ruin the camera here, but I've got to get this up. Um, it's called Motor Dacker. Motor Dacker, sick. Yeah, it's just that's just only ACDC and Motorhead. <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, been exploring a little bit. I'll probably like have a bit of time to dive into some new music while I'm here. So if anyone's got any suggestions, hit me up. Will do. So send you some random shit. Yeah. Yeah. Sick dude. Well, that's uh, that's cool there. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for uh, coming on again. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Sure. We'll see yeah, you soon. Hopefully. Good chat again. Yeah. Well, fuck. Maybe while I'm bored, I might just. Come over to Adelaide for a bit. Who knows? <laughs> Come build our state champs track or something. That'd be sick. Yeah, well, you organise it. Let me know. <laughs> Easy, man. Well, um, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, yeah, thanks, you.